Uh, so I'm really excited for our next session. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, a panel of uh, family members and patients to talk about the impact of adverse experiences. I think the Hear Her campaign from the CDC is really important for us to hear those messages and how patients uh, don't aren't being heard when they bring up issues. And I think we can all be informed by that. So really excited about this session. Uh, so our moderator for this session will be Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Janet uh, Dukes. Uh, Janet is the co-chair of the Community Health Committee in the Texas Collaborative for Healthy Mothers and Babies and the chair of the Race Equity Workgroup. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in child and family studies and a master's degree in public health. Uh, she is a certified health education specialist and is currently a full-time student at Texas A&M University working toward her doctorate in uh, public health uh, in health promotion community health sciences. At a and in addition to her doctoral studies, she works as a graduate research assistant in the School of Public Health. Uh, Ms. Dukes is an adjunct of faculty at Baylor University in the Family and Consumer Sciences Department and the School of Public Health. Uh, welcome, Ms. Dukes. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Um, I am especially excited um, to introduce this panel and to be moderating this panel. Um, one of my favorite sessions at the TCHMB conferences or when we get to hear um, from those that kind of make this work impactful and can kind of give us feedback about how we're doing as we serve women and children and babies, and that is our patients. And so um, on our family patient panel, we have um, four speakers, um, April Chavez, Brianna Harris, and Tiffany and Stephen Bowen. And so I am going to read all three um, of your introductions, and then I will allow you all to go ahead and um, take the show. Um, and each one of you will speak. Um, April will go first, followed by Tiffany and Steven, um, followed by Brianna. And so up first, April Chavez um, is a maternal sepsis survivor and patient advocate. She serves as a maternal sepsis spokesperson, spoke spokeswoman for Sepsis, the legacy of Rory Salton, and as a member of the National Family Council on Sepsis. April's goal as a patient advocate is to help educate others about the symptoms of sepsis and the importance of advocating for your own health or the health of those around you. She has bravely shared her story with local and national outlets, including WebMD, in an effort to spread sepsis awareness. April lives in Lubbock, Texas with her husband, son, and Bassett Hound. Stephen Bowen has successfully transitioned from one of the former premier, um, from one of the premier defensive linemen in professional football to the head of game initiative of the National Football League. After spending five seasons with the Dallas Cowboys and four seasons with the Washington Redskins and helping them become NFC East champions as a team captain, Stephen finished his playing career with the New York Jets. Stephen graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in inter Interdisciplinary Studies from Hofstra, Hofstra University and a Master's of Business Administration from the George Washington University. Tiffany Bowen wears many hats, including running a popular NYC restaurant and lounge and supporting several philanthropic initiatives. She also sits on the board of directors for the New York City Hospitality um, Alliance and is the treasurer of the National Restaurant and Bar Association. Tiffany received her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Hofstra University, Masters of Arts and Teaching from the University of Southern California, business, Masters of Business Administration from the George Washington University, and Doctorate of, Educa of Education from the University of Southern California. Stephen and Tiffany founded Skyler's Gift Foundation in 2011 after the loss of their son Skyler to prematurity related causes. Skyler's Gift pays for burial and cremation costs for families who have lost their premature infants, as well as grief counseling. Stephen and Tiffany served as ambassadors for the March of Dimes national chapter in both 2012 and 2013. Um, together, the Bowens have raised hundreds of thousands for infant health research and familial bereavement services. Um, Stephen and Tiffany's greatest joy are their three children, Trinity, Stephen III, and Skylar. And last but certainly not least, Brianna Harris Henderson, is the founder and president for Let's Talk PPCM. In that role, um, Ms. Harris shares the story of countless women battling peripartum cardiomyopathy prior to the founding of Let's Talk PPCM. Um, Harris started as a patient advocate for Baylor Scott and White University 
and she resides in Grand Prairie, Texas with her husband and two children. Um, so thank you all and welcome today. Thank you all for being here. In April, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah, we okay, have, yeah. I see people. Yeah, okay, perfect. I just wanted to double check. Today's already been a day. We've had crazy weather in Lubbock and so daycare was closed. My husband is working from home and I'm at home. So y'all bear with me if it's crazy at my house, but hopefully we'll be okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to participate in this year's summit. I work in the communications profession and I truly just believe that just talking about experiences and sharing best practices um, and just sharing that knowledge with one another can make a big difference. Before I jump into my story, I wanted to thank each of you for the work that you do day in and day out. Um, as I talk about my story, I'll be perfectly honest about my frustrations with my particular medical team. However, I recognize that you all face challenges in the medical field and as humans, things do go wrong. Um, but my goal is to really just use my experience as a reminder of the power that you hold in helping new families get the best start and how important it is to listen to a mother's instinct. Um, so in September of 2017, I delivered a healthy baby boy and I was the happiest woman on earth. My husband and I had struggled for a couple years to get pregnant. So when my son was born, I finally felt like this was it. This was finally the start to my fairy tale. I had a healthy pregnancy and a normal delivery, but on the day that I was supposed to be discharged from the hospital, I started to feel sick. I began to have fever, chills, just an overall feeling of weakness. I became short of breath and I felt like my heart was racing. I told my doctors about all of my symptoms, um, but I was basically just kind of brushed off and I was told that I was likely just anxious about being a new mom. They ran some tests and my white blood cell count was higher than the previous tests. But again, I was just brushed off and told that that was normal after childbirth. Um, when I was shivering from my fever, I was told to take a hot shower. And one doctor even turned the thermostat in my room up to 80 degrees to stop, stop me from shivering. Um, when my fever turned to sweats, a nurse brought me a fan. And again, I just, I wasn't taken seriously. Over the next few days, I continued to complain to my doctors, um, but I continued to be ignored. One doctor even told me that I was being crazy and I needed to stop. As a young Hispanic female and a first time mom, having a male doctor tell you that you're being crazy is scary. I didn't feel safe or heard. I felt intimidated and just really scared. Um, at that point, I really began to question myself, like, what if I was crazy? What if this is how all new moms feel after childbirth and maybe I, I'm just being a wimp? So after the doctors had given me enough medicine to make my fever go away for a while, they told me that my new mom anxieties would probably just go away when I got home. I was just, I needed to go home and rest and relax. So they sent me home with a prescription for anxiety medication. Um, and not being a medical professional or knowing what an elevated heart rate, high white blood cell count meant, I actually believed the doctors. I thought that maybe I was just anxious. Maybe I would feel better when I got home. Not Trusting my own body and my own instinct is my biggest regret, and it nearly cost me my life. When I got home, my symptoms didn't improve. I took all of the medications that they gave me, including all of the anxiety medication that they had prescribed, um, but my heart just continued to race. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't care for my newborn baby. I was just out of it. Um, finally, my mom, convinced me to go back to the hospital. And on the way back, I remember telling her about the doctor who told me I was acting crazy. And I was really just second guessing going back because 
I was afraid, I was afraid that they were just going to send me back home again. Like I didn't want to be turned away again, but I am so thankful that my mom kept driving and she insisted that I get checked out. After a short stay in triage, I was admitted into the hospital due to suspicions of an infection. But over like the next 24 hours in labor and delivery, my condition didn't improve at all. Instead, I got sicker and sicker as each hour passed. The OBGYN team had basically no real answers for my family. And what I think saved my life was when they couldn't find my vein to place an IV, they called in a nurse from a rapid response team and his only job was to come in and stick the IV in me. But as soon as he looked at the numbers on my chart, he knew something was really wrong. And rather than waiting around, he actually just took me up to the ICU himself and that's kind of how I ended up there. Um, but I'm confident that had he not taken that quick action, there's no doubt that I would not have survived another 24 hours in the labor and delivery unit. Excuse me. Um, I really believe that my OBGYN team was in over their heads at that point, but instead of looking for answers or consulting with other departments, they just didn't do anything. Over the next couple of weeks um, in the ICU and other areas of the hospital, I was treated for sepsis, endometritis, septic shock, kidney failure, PE blood clots, the list goes on. Like you name it, I had it. Um, I don't really remember that much from my nine days in the ICU, um, but when I woke up from the medically induced coma, I was so confused. I, like, where was my son? Did I even have a baby? Was that a dream? I was just completely confused. So finally, as I started to become more aware, my family and the ICU doctors tried to explain to me that I had developed an infection of an unknown source. And that was the very first time that I had ever heard the word sepsis. At that time, I had no idea what septic shock meant. I, like I said, I was just very confused. I had no idea that I had literally just escaped death. I had no idea that during my time in the ICU, the doctors told my family to call those closest to me to come and say their goodbyes. Um, I had no idea that my husband had to think about how he was gonna raise the, this baby that we'd prayed for for so long by himself and that my son came so close to growing up without his mom. And because I didn't know what sepsis was, I had no idea what I had survived had killed so many other people. Um, throughout my one month stay in the hospital, I constantly heard from OBGYN professionals about how rare sepsis is. But as I got my strength back and I did more research, I realized sepsis really isn't rare at all. And it's actually the third leading cause of maternal deaths. And while this might sound kind of harsh, now that I look back on things, them telling me how rare it was only seems like an excuse for them not taking me serious when I complained to them about all of those symptoms and that something was actually wrong. I think it's important for everyone to remember that just because something is rare doesn't mean that it can't happen and running tests to rule something out could save someone's life. I realize now that I should have never let my medical team brush me off or have me second guessing if I was crazy. I wish they would have taken more time to really explain to me what sepsis was and how it could affect me long term. Um, right now, like I'm physically fine, but no one prepared me for the emotional toll that sepsis has taken on me to this very day. My regrets and standing up for myself and not standing up for myself and really just not educating myself before I went into childbirth. Um, I didn't, I didn't really think about all of the things that could go wrong. Like I took every childbirth class, every book that I could find 
I didn't really read about sepsis or any of those things that could go wrong. I think most of the focus was just on a healthy baby. So that's another regret that I have is just not educating myself as a mother about those things that yes, they are scary, um, but they could happen. And I think if I would have been a little bit better educated, maybe I would have stood my grand stood my ground more. But I was I was afraid. I trusted that the doctors knew what was best, and I was just this new mom who didn't really know what was normal and what wasn't. Um, so all of that has led me to become involved with Ensepsis, the legacy of Rory Staunton. And my goal really in sharing my story is to not only educate others about the symptoms of septis, sepsis and advocating for your own health, but advocating for those, um, those around you. My family has said numerous times that they wish that they would have known because I wasn't in that right headspace to kind of stand my ground with the doctors. But if they had known what it was, maybe they could have been my advocate. So, and it really hurts to hear my mom say that because I know she feels really guilty, but um, it's an experience that has also brought our family a lot closer together as well. So I really have a special place in my heart for mothers to be. And I hope that more OBGYN teams will not only educate themselves on sepsis so that no families have to go through what mine did, but even more so, I hope that they listen to their patients if they feel that something is not right and actually search for answers. Um, I just, I don't feel like telling somebody that they're crazy is the right thing to do in a situation like that. And that's something that sticks with me forever. Um, so I just encourage all of the healthcare providers that if a patient is insisting that something is wrong, just to be patient with them and explain things to them and do everything that you can to rule something out. Because like I said, just because something is rare as they said it was, it doesn't mean that it can't happen. And it doesn't mean that it can't affect someone forever. Um, and finally, my last biggest hope is that like I said earlier, women really get to educate themselves before they go into childbirth. I think we spend a lot of time focusing on the babies, but sometimes we don't always think about the health of the mothers and pregnancy and delivery and just the whole thing takes such a toll on a woman's body. So I hope that we can give a little bit more attention to mothers and I hope that new mothers stand their ground if they feel that something isn't right. Thank you so much, April, for sharing your story. Um, and the chat, just as you've been talking, I've been kind of just glancing through um, the comments and there's just outpour of support and gratitude for you sharing your story today. Um, as we know, it's gonna help um, lots of future patients. So thank you. Um, Stephen and Tiffany, you all are next. Yes, thank you for having us. Um, and thank you, April, for sharing your story. Um, in 2011, Stephen and I had a one-year-old and we were excited about the upcoming arrival of our twin boys in October. On the first day of my 24th week of pregnancy in late June, I went into labor seemingly out of nowhere. And by the time I realized that anything was wrong, I was already 10, 10 centimeters dilated I was in Dallas alone. Steven was in New York City. Remember, I was only 24 weeks, so we weren't expecting anything to happen. Um, my prior experience of a normal vaginal delivery surrounded by my husband and my family was nothing like this one. I had an emergency C-section alone and very afraid. But Steven and Skylar were delivered at one pound and six ounces and one pound and seven ounces respectively. Like we all know, the NICU experience with micropemies is a roller coaster journey. The highs and lows change moment to moment. Things are going great one minute, and a few minutes later, something goes wrong. The NICU is a perfect recipe for post traumatic stress disorder. Our experience was no different. We had good moments, and then we had bad. The worst came for us on July 8th when Skylar, 
became sick with an intestinal infection and passed away within hours. Up until this point, he had been our stronger baby with minimal issues and more consistent weight gain. In a matter of hours, that all changed. The moments after for us are a blur. Some kind of way we were still functioning, some kind of way we planned a funeral and pushed forward to care for Stephen, who was now in the NICU alone. This does not discriminate, regardless of income. At the time, I was an NFL player and a free agent, not knowing where I would be playing the following year. My career and my family's future hung in the balance. In the weeks after Skylar's death, I attended a few groups hosted by the NICU social worker at the hospital, and we all shared our experiences. A few of them did not sit right with me. Other mothers were telling me how they had too lost the baby, but were having difficulty coming up with the money to bury their baby, and they were running out of time. I asked, what do you mean running out of time? And the reply was that the hospital gave you a certain number of days to have a funeral home or crematory pick up the body. And of course, this costs money. And if you couldn't do so, the hospital would either do a mass cremation with all of the other unclaimed bodies, or some hospitals would consider the, the baby's medical waste and dispose of them as such. Of course, I was horrified. Immediately in the wake of this intense grieving, the sirens in my head went off and I knew that this would be our purpose. A few months after Skylar's death and after we were able to get Stephen home, we formed Skylar's Gift, a 501c nonprofit that pays for the funeral and burial costs for premature infants when a family can't afford to do so. Since 2011, we've, we've helped families from all across the United States in their most devastating time. After we help with the funeral, we follow up with connections to free mental health counseling in their local area. We run Skylar's gifts solely off the generosity of others and our own funds. We truly believe this is the gift that our son Skylar gave us. In the past almost 10 years, our mission has remained the same, to help people at their lowest in this far too common, but very rarely talked about predicament. However, in addition to getting people to immediate, getting people the immediate cash they need, Skylar's gift has also pivoted to include bringing awareness to black maternal health. Why do black mothers fare worse? In the past, mothers with higher education and higher incomes were assumed to have better maternal health and better outcomes. However, we now know that Black mothers, despite education, income, and access to proper medical, medical care, still, still fare worse than their white counterparts. Skylar's gift will continue to assist all families in their immediate time of need. However, we recognize that without getting to the root of the problem, the number of families we need to help won't decrease. That is why our approach has to be twofold, getting folks cash and exposing and assisting in how we can find a solution to skin color automatically making pregnancy high risk. Thank you for listening. Thank you to you both again for sharing your story and your experience. Um, last but not least, Brianna. All right, hello everyone. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, so my story is uh, a little different. Uh, I was pregnant with my second child in 2016. Um, I had a I, I guess it was a good pregnancy, you know, everything, I was healthy uh, for the most part. I did everything I was supposed to. Uh, I did notice, however, that I did kept, um, I kept my morning sickness. So I was sick um, basically the whole nine months. And um, it was it was crazy. I remember complaining to my obstetrician, you know, about it. And um, I just kind of had you know, told her that I had went and got some over-the-counter meds, which she told me that was fine, you know, and if she had to prescribe some, she would, but I was like, no, you know, so I, I took um, nausea pills, you know, as a, when I needed, you know, to try to eat or anything, couldn't keep anything down really, majority of the nine months, but um, I did, however, it kept my weight or gained weight, so towards the eighth month of 
pregnancy, um, I had started noticing like a flutter of something in my chest, well, in my heart. I don't know, it was like a bubbly feeling. I remember feeling. And um, I had asked my obstetrician, uh, cause I think at this point I was going every week. So I was seeing her every week. And uh, I just had randomly asked her if she could check my heart, you know, cause um, I just told her I felt something weird going on that I didn't feel in my first pregnancy. And so, um, mind you, I'm carrying a, a, a girl at that time, and I had a boy the first time. So I'm thinking everything is going to be completely different because I'm carrying a girl this time. So um, after she told me, she said, yeah, I do. I hear a murmur. And uh, she was like, but it's a harmless murmur. She was like, you know, um, it, it'll go away after uh, the birth. And so I was like, okay. So I didn't um, worry about any of that anymore. Uh, when it came time to uh, induce, because uh, my water didn't break both times, I had to get induced both times. Um, so when once uh, the induction, um, everything, everything went well until I got to uh, eight centimeters. When I got to eight centimeters, uh, my cervix would not dilate anymore past that. And um, I remember um, my obstetrician telling me that uh, she had a felt like a lump or something in my uterus where it was blocking the baby's head from coming down. And uh, um, she had told me that, you know, we was going to have to do an emergency C-section at first um, if, you know, the baby couldn't pass through whatever it was that was, you know, in the way of the surface. So um, she was like, I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back in 30 minutes and we're going to try to see, you know, if, if you can push, if you can, then, you know, um, we'll go ahead and give birth that way. So she came back 30 minutes later and uh, I remember I had just got the epidural again. And uh, at this time, it's probably by maybe the fourth time I think I done got it or third, fourth time. And so I remember it wearing off slowly while I was uh, in the process of pushing. So I, I felt everything, but it was no pain. So I was able to feel, you know, her head to get her pushed, whatever past, whatever lump that the obstetrician felt. I never asked any questions about the lump. I don't know what about the lump. I'm still learning. So. Um, Everything went fine until um, uh, about, it took about 30 minutes at, uh, after the birth to, to remove the placenta. So my placenta, uh, whatever the cause was, I'm not sure why it was stuck, but I do know that it didn't happen like that the first time. And so I remember asking her, I was like, is everything okay? You know, because I was ready to hold my baby, you know, uh, my husband, he was tending to her and, you know, the nurses and um, everyone over there with the baby and stuff. And I'm just here, you know, ready to hold her. And uh, she was like, everything's fine. Um, she was like, do you know your blood type? And uh, I was like, no, you know, I don't know my blood type. And, uh, and she said, okay, well, it's nothing. You know, she said, we'll get it. And so I said, okay, you know, <laughs> and um, that pretty much was it. So 30 minutes later, uh, the, the placenta was delivered um, and everything started to progress as normal, you know, and to me. So uh, after we was put in our room, um, as the hours was passing by, you know, I was starting to feel a little icky. They had already confirmed that I could take showers or anything. And so uh, I wanted to do that. Uh, I remember before I took a shower, I remember filling up five of the medical pads or the pads that they have in there for us, uh, the, uh, for the ladies. And I filled up five in one hour and they're, they're long, they're long. And I filled up five. And so um, I thought that was so gross. I, I had went back to the shower. Well, I went to the restroom because I was trying to clean myself up. And I remember getting in the shower. I was like, okay, maybe if I get in the shower, it'll slow it down or it slowed its bleeding down. And so I got in the shower and it was just still drip, 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 drip. And so I was like, oh my goodness, you know? So I was like, this is crazy. So I got out the shower. I had, um, at this point I'm still leaking. It's just, it's leaking. So, uh, but it was like a slow leak. So it wasn't just coming out glitching like when your water breaks. So I, um, at this point I wrapped some towels around my feet. I started walking to the toilet. And, um, you know, just to kind of get myself together, put back on my, my gear and stuff. Um, and I, after I sat down, I remember hearing blah, 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 blah. And so I looked down at the toilet and it was just a bunch of clots in the toilet, like it filled the toilet up. So um, 
at this point, I'm thinking this is normal. This is the second baby. Um, so I, I, I guess this is, you know, I, she didn't tell me anything. You know, I just remember her asking me about the blood type. You know, I'm trying to put together in my mind while I'm on the toilet trying to, well, okay, it wasn't nothing I had to worry about. So that's what I went with. And I, after I cleaned myself up and everything, um, I was still kind of leaking a lot. And at this point, it was kind of a, a starting to be an overflow. So I guess more was starting to come out. And I, I remember wrapping my feet again. So I was walking across the room. I was making sure the baby was okay. She was put down in the little, you know, death net thing. And my husband was on the couch. He was taking a nap. So he was like in and out. But I remember asking him, I was like, oh, I was like, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I have to walk with these towels. Or I remember telling him, you know, I had to walk with these towels. And he was like, oh, you know, you need to sit down or, you know, because he, he didn't know. And so uh, I was like, yeah, I said, you know, I'll take a little nap or something. So I had walked to the bed with my towels, sat down. And I remember just kind of relaxing. And something told me, Brianna, call your nurse and let her know what's going on. So I called the nurse. I let her know, get in here, uh, you know, just something weird going on in the toilet, you know, I can't stop the bleeding, you know, or it won't slow down, I know it, it's probably normal, because I knew that she probably was going to say that, that's what I was thinking, she got in the room, and it was about five seconds when she looked, uh, she just, you know, pulled my, my, my thing down, and she looked, um, and she quickly got on her nurse phone, and she had started dialing these other nurses, um, for the before you know it, it was at least five or six seconds. I fainted. I started fainting. I felt myself. I told her, I said, I, I had grabbed her arm. I said, I feel, I said, I feel like I'm going to faint. And so pretty much I started blacking on out. And um, the, the room filled quickly. It filled quickly with a bunch of nurses, doctors. The main voice that I remember hearing was the anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist he came in there. He did his thing. He you know, he's telling me, the, the, the women, you need to do this, you need to do that. What is her blood type? What is this? Get this in here. Get that. So he was on a roll. And I'm sitting here going unconscious, but I could hear what's going on. So I'm at this point, now my obstetrician, she's pushing on my stomach. I felt that pain. I, I was I was falling out of it, but I felt that pain. And she was pushing and she was like, I got to get these class out. She was like, Miss Harris, just stay with me. Just stay with me. So I remember her telling me that, you know, and I was just trying to stay, stay alive. You know, I remember them putting my husband out. They put the baby out. You know, it was it was bad. And so um, after they started doing the, the transfusions, they had did four transfusions. Um, they got me into the emergency surgery. Uh, it took five hours for them to stop the bleeding. Um, for them to find the cause to the bleeding, they said they was about to rip my uterus out, but fortunately they was able to keep that intact. So um, after that, I was readmitted. Me and my daughter, we was readmitted into the hospital just to, uh, so they could kind of, uh, you know, monitor me, make sure that I didn't bleed again. And uh, also to keep an eye on the baby, make sure she was okay. And uh, we stayed there about another four or five days. And um, before we left, I remember asking my obstetrician, I was like, um, I know it's weird and, you know, it's nothing about me. It's always about the baby. But I asked her if she can check my heart again just to make sure that, you know, because I had felt, I don't know, I just felt something like I did when I when my body told me to call the nurse, <laughs> you know. And so um, once I did that, she was like, OK, you know, that's that's fine. She was like, I do that for you, you know. And so she sent up this echocardiogram machine. This is my first time, you know, trying to learn about the echocardiogram. And they were just telling me what it what it does. And so I was like, OK, you know, so they did it. And um, before I was discharged, she came back uh, to my obstetrician. She came back to the room. She looked at everything and she had uh, confirmed everything was OK. She said, your echocardiogram looks good. Everything looks good. You know, my uh, vaginal area, everything was in, in coming into fact now. So uh, we was able to go home. And uh, once getting home, I really uh, didn't have much to pay attention to. At least I didn't think I did. So about two, three weeks later, um, you know, me being happy mom and stuff, baby, uh, I remember developing a cough. And um, it was just a regular cough. I thought maybe it was because my sinus, I have really bad sinus and allergy issues. So I was thinking, okay, you know, these allergies and sinus, you know, and then it's December by this time. So, you know, I'm just not even thinking about anything else or anything bad. <laughs> 
And so um, once the cough kind of progressed, it got to uh, Christmas Day. Christmas Day, um, I remember going to the gathering and uh, my dad had looked at me and I was like, you look bad, you know, you look sick. And I was like, I got this allergy. He was like, yeah, well, I got some medicine. You know, you could take this medicine. And I was like, okay. So I took the medicine. Nothing. It didn't work. It didn't work. Not after two hours, not after three hours. Nothing worked. The, the whatever I was feeling, you know, I felt a clocky throat you know, and I was coughing. And so I told him, I said, I'll just take another pill when I get home, dad, you know, later. So after me and my family get home, um, you know, at this point, we, we got, you know, food and we got the baby bag and stuff. My husband got the kids, you know. Uh, I was getting out the car and we was living um, in certain apartments at the time. So from getting out the car, probably about maybe, mm, maybe a three and two minute walk, a three minute walk to our uh, apartment. So I got out the car and I remember going out of breath, like halfway to our stairs to get to the stairs. And I um, told my husband, I said, y'all go ahead. I said, I'm, I'm, you know, dragging back here. And so I got to the steps. Uh, it was about probably 14 steps. I made it halfway, so halfway there. I told my husband, I said, oh, I can't walk up the stairs no more. I said, I'm tired. You know, I'm tired. And so he was like, okay, you know, so he grabbed everything that I had in my hand, you know, everybody got in the house and I told him I'm coming. So he came back for me, he made sure I got up, you know, in the stairs. I remember falling out on our couch. I filed out on the couch because I was like, oh, I'm tired. I said, I feel like I just ran up those stairs and I just barely walked up the stairs. And so uh, I was completely out of breath. But after I got myself together, I was like, okay, I'm good. I just had a baby. That's the main thing that's many that, you know, and then it was the second baby. So of course, you know, the different pregnancies, different everything. So I know that it's probably normal. Uh, I breastfed that night. So I was doing every two hours, I would get up and I would also pump. Uh, that night when I was pumping, I felt my heart, um, that's pounding, like it was racing or something. And I remember asking my husband, I was uh, asking to listen to, I, you know, just a weird question, this heart thing again. And so he listened to it and he was like, yeah, it do sound a little, a uh, little fast. And I was like, yeah, I said, I guess because I'm pumping, <laughs> you know, and uh, I was like, well, I'll just leave it alone. So after I was done pumping, I got to the bed. Everybody is at this point laying down asleep. I, uh, when I, as soon as I tried to lay flat, I remember feeling like I was underwater. It felt like I was underwater for a long time. And uh, I was like, oh my goodness, I ain't never felt that before. And I even with my sinus, it, uh, you know, sinuses. And so I had texted my dad, it was like at four in the morning by this point. So now I didn't even get no sleep. You know, I'm still getting up every two uh, hours pumping. So I wasn't getting no sleep that night. And I texted my dad and I said, dad, I said, oh, I've been up all night. I said, I couldn't breathe while I tried to lay down. I said, so I'm just sitting up right now. And so he takes like he said, that don't sound normal, Bree. You need to go to the hospital. That, that sounds like pneumonia or bronchitis. And I was like, oh, you know, well, I got the baby. I said, I can't watch, you know, I, I ain't gonna be able to go to the hospital. And so he was like, well, see if, you know, uh, see if you get somebody to watch the baby, you know. So I, I called my mother-in-law and she was able to watch uh, our daughter. Uh, my son was able to go to his grandmother's house. And my husband, I told him to go ahead and go to work because I didn't want him worry, you know, uh, being stressed out and stuff. So uh, he went to work and my dad went ahead and came and got me, took me to the hospital. Uh, upon, upon arriving to the hospital, they checked my vital signs. Um, they did notice that my heart was beating irregularly and uh, my oxygen levels was about at 82. So they knew that there was something going on with whatever my respiratory. Um, I remember a nurse walking me around. They, was, uh, they said they needed to know how fast it was gonna take to run out of breath. Uh, it took me five minutes. Um, everything that I had I told them it felt like I just ran for them <laughs> and so um they had got me the x-ray uh the x-ray had showed the fluid around the heart and lungs and then uh, after they removed the uh, the fluid with the Lasix um I was peeing probably like every three minutes I had to go to the restroom I lost 40 pounds within those few minutes and so um after they did that I was able to breathe to lay down they did the CT scan when they did the CT scan, they saw that the heart was enlarged. So at this point, me and my dad looking at each other, because at this point is when the story, uh, it is when my story kind of brought into what I do now. Uh, 
me and my dad looked at each other and we kind of hard and flew it around the lungs. We was like, okay, we just went through this um, three years ago with my sister. You know, uh, we my sister had um, died from a cardiac arrest at 27 years old. And uh, it was an unknown cause. They didn't know uh, what happened or what had caused her to go into cardiac arrest. They actually um, diagnosed it as a natural cause for a 27 year old, um, Mm -hmm. you know, who had a baby within six months. So I, you know, I'm trying to put together everything in my head. I'm like, okay, I I done asked about my heart. I already asked. I did that, you know, when I had just gave birth, when I went through all this other stuff. And, you know, where they was like, well, it's something going on with the heart. So they admitted me. Um, They sent up the echocardiogram again. The echocardiogram, I was like, I already did that, you know, and I'm like, I got to do this again. They was like, yeah, you got to do it again. They ordered it. I was like, okay, you know, so. I didn't see a cardiologist until the next day. So the next day, the cardiologist came in and, um, you know, you could tell on his face that he didn't want to, you know, break that to me like that. But, you know, he knew he had to. Um, But he came in, he was reading in my file. I remember that. He was reading in my file and he said, uh, hi, you know, he was like, I see um, that you had a sister that uh, died of a cardiac arrest, you know. And I was like, yeah, you know, she, uh, she did. And I said, we never found out why. And uh, he was like, okay. He was like, "Um, did she happen to have a baby like that? And I had said, yeah. I said, she did. And uh, he was like, okay. He said, and you just had a baby. I said, yeah, I did. You know, and he was like, okay, about two months ago. But I said, yeah. And so um, he was like, okay. Um, He said, well, I looked at your echo. Uh, He said that your heart function is working uh, at 15%, 15 to 20%. And he said, it's supposed to be a 55 to 60 percent he said you're in full-blown heart failure um you know and uh he said that it was uh I was suffering from a condition called peripartum cardiomyopathy so uh PPCM for short and I was like peripartum cardiomyopathy I said well I ain't never heard of that before you know I ain't never heard that no about any of that and he's uh after you know looking at my file real good he said um your sister had peripartum cardiomyopathy as well. So at that point, they end up changing my sister's history. Well, changed it in my file that my sister was actually, um, di- well, they, he diagnosed her uh, with the PPCM, even though she was no longer here. So that part in my file had actually changed for future reference. So um, after that, he told me my treatment options and everything. I had to wear a life vest for seven months. I wore the life vest for seven months. My heart function didn't increase to what he needed it to be. So about 35% is where we needed it to be. So I wouldn't have to be at risk for cardiac arrest. Um, but it didn't and it didn't progress within that time frame. So I had to get the implantable defibrillator. So I do have an ICD now. Um, my heart function did improve to fully recovered. I am fully recovered now. It's been two, uh, well, it's been four years now, but two and a half years later after the diagnosis. Um, I actually have fully recovered. I'm still on medications. They said forever because the medications help increase the heart function. I have to, you know, be on meds now. Um, But I'll take whatever can help keep me here longer, you know, and um, pretty much from then on, uh, I remember searching in um, for PPCM in a Facebook group. Well, I found some Facebook groups. I remember searching it in Facebook and the groups have popped up. And so I was like, oh my God, I said, I thought I was the only one who had it or me and my sister was the only two, you know, because they said it was rare. And so I'm like, all these women got this illness. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I'm reading the stories and all the stories is like, you know, amazing. All of them is different. It led to different, but it all added up to the same diagnosis, but everybody, it happened differently. And so I, I thought it would be a good idea to take those stories out of this private group and to actually start um, a blog with it so that people can see that it wasn't actually just this rare because normally when we hear rare as a patient, we thinking, oh, it's not gonna be me. That's not gonna be me. And that's me, All of, uh, that was me. I was like, nope, that's not gonna be me. It was me. And so um, I, I just feel like I had to do something about that. 
And so I end up t um, changing my blog uh, from, the, it was Let's Talk PBCM is what I named it. I end up turning it into an or organization. Um, so now I'm able to um, try to spread awareness the best that I can. Um, you know, our main mission is to basically uh, to increase the research. Um, we want to be able to learn more about PBCM. And, you know, it's just, it's so much more out there that I feel like, you know, can be, um, taught on it and not just that condition, of course, all the cardiac uh, conditions, but PPCM and the, the way how it's affecting women and even the ones that go undiagnosed, like my sister in her case, she was misdiagnosed, ended up dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, she also had that as her foul as a natural cause for a 27 year old. And that's just, you know, we never had heart problems in the family, never. So, um, it was just something that was just thrown at us, you know, so I'm just grateful to be uh, here to be able to help in any way and share my story. And I hope that it helps, you know, for the next patient that you all may come in contact with. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brianna, for sharing your story. Um, and just with all the details so that we fully understood your walk um, and what that was like for you. Um, so we are now entering our um, Q&A period. Um, I have, I'm gonna start us off um, with the first question, which is directed at both um, April and Brianna. And then the second question that I ask, that I'll ask is specific to um, both Stephen and Tiffany. Um, and so for um, April and Brianna, um, one of our um, objectives for this session is to identify gaps in care, communication, and equity from the patient and family perspective. Um, so what role would you say um, communication or lack thereof um, played into the success or failure um, of your treatment and your entire medical experience? And what is something that you would have changed or wish you would have maybe known now or known back then that you know now um, that could have shifted or changed your experience. So kind of twofold. Um, the first part around how communication with your provider team and your healthcare team, how communication played in to your experience, and then what is something you wish you knew then or would change. And so we'll go April first and then Brianna. Okay, let's hope I can answer all parts of that question because it was a long one. But uh, to address the first part, as far as communication goes, I feel like that was probably the biggest thing that kind of prevented me from getting the care that I think I should have gotten. Um, I don't feel like I had a strong line of communication between myself and the doctors. Um, I had been seeing my normal doctor throughout my whole pregnancy, but it just so happened that he wasn't able to deliver my baby. So I had just all of these strangers, um, which I understand is normal, but I think that was kind of a challenge. But the whole time, I just felt like I wasn't being heard. Like I kept saying all of these symptoms and I felt like no one was listening to me. And just rather than searching for a solution to why I was feeling the symptoms, they were just more worried about making them go away so that they could send me home. Like I didn't feel like anyone was just worried about well, why is why does she have a fever? Why I why is her white blood cell count normal? Like yes, that can be normal after childbirth, but no one was really looking into the why, um, and just no one communicated with me. It was just they just made me feel just unheard throughout it all. Um, can you repeat the second part of the question? <laughs> Yeah, the second part was just what you wish you would have known back then, um, or that you could would have changed, um, knowing back then what you know now. Oh, there's so much I wish I would have known. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I wish I would have known like more about all the things that could go wrong. And I really wish that I would have just advocated for myself more. I think I let um, doctors convince me that I was being crazy like that just that comment just sticks out in my mind and it just 
kind of wrecked my confidence in like something is wrong. Like when they told me you need to stop, you're being crazy. It was kind of just like, okay, this is probably normal then. Like if they're telling me it's fine and I'm just anxious about being a new mom, maybe they're right. Maybe I just need to just try to calm down and breathe. And so I really just wish I would have advocated more for myself. Thank you, April and Brianna. Okay, what was the first question? I want to make sure I get that. Um, just the role that you felt um, communication um, from your healthcare and provider team, whether positive, negative, um, the role communication played mm -hmm. in your overall medical experience. Uh, oh my goodness, mine, it was, it was great. I, uh, I, I don't hear it a lot, but um, you know, my medical team was, they was on point. Everything went the way that it was supposed mm -hmm. to go. I actually remember um, when I went through the hemorrhaging spell, I actually remember actually going to uh, YouTube to look up what happens when a woman hemorrhage and they did everything, the whole protocol, you know, so I love that. Uh, so I knew that I had a good team. Um, what I wish I would have known though, was when I asked her during the delivery, when I asked her, was everything okay? That was the first question. And then, um, but, you know, our, our doctors don't want us panicky. They don't want us worrying. They don't want us to lift that blood pressure any higher than whatever they're dealing with. So, you know, but it could actually, you know, be, become a life and death situation in my case because I was told that it, everything was fine. I didn't need to know my blood type. Everything was good, you know. Um, I, that's how I, that's how I had it in my mind. So as I'm bleeding out these clots, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that that was something to look out for if your placenta doesn't come out, um, you know, right after birth. I didn't know that, um, you know, uh, preeclampsia. I haven't. I, I remember hearing about it or being tested for the glucose and everything. Um, so I remember that uh, I did learn, however, about the the pro BNP, um, the blood test. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if that when does that actually come to play, but I wish I would have learned or knew about that as well to at least ask for it or ask for that test to see, you know, if I was showing any heart or cardiac issues. Um, so I do uh, wish I would have known a little bit more in that field. And also for my husband, um, you know, not, we don't really know how to um, add the spouse in and be able to make sure they know exactly what's going on because my husband looking at me walking around with these towels around my feet he's thinking this is normal I'm thinking this is normal you know and I'm not panicky he's not panicky you know okay well she's okay you know but I, I, I was about to go to sleep and I would have died right in my sleep so I feel like I, I, you know I, I really wish I would have known a little bit more about that those seriousness of things that can happen or go wrong thank you Brianna um, and our next question is specific for Stephen and Tiffany, um, and it comes from one of our um, physicians, um, Tiffany and Stephen, how did you go from such an incredible loss to becoming empowered to help others who are less fortunate or who go through a similar loss? How did you find the strength? Mm. That's a good question. I always say you don't really know how strong you are, and so you have to be. So you just find it some kind of way. And I think we just felt inspired by the other people who were also sharing with us their similar situations. And for us, we definitely didn't want Skylar's death to be in vain. Um, obviously we were already dealing with something so devastating, but I think it would have been more devastating if we hadn't used it in a way that helps others. So really through the experience, it, it kind of helped with the grieving. You kind of are grieving while you're helping. It's kind of like therapy, um, if that makes sense. And when parents apply for assistance and you read the story, it's the same story over and over. It's just a different name. So when people say I lost my baby and they were 24 weeks or they were 25 weeks or however, and this is what happened and I need help. I'm reading my story. I'm reading our story over and over. So we can, we can sympathize or we can really empathize with them as well. As opposed to them, yeah. yeah. I think Tiff hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, going through that experience was traumatic, but seeing other families that 
weren't financially stable to lay their child to rest, man, that just, it, it broke our hearts, man. So I think it, it came about organically and we knew that we were in a financial situation to naturally help people that going through the same things as us. So it was, uh, yeah, it definitely, it, it definitely was therapy for us. Definitely was therapy for us. Sure. And, the, and the funny part about it, uh, you know, is that Steve and I never actually had a conversation about it. I don't think I never remember sitting down and saying, hey, uh, this is a problem that I saw. Do you want to start a foundation? I think I just we just went into it, you know, so just very organic, as Stephen said. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, really empowering um, that you can turn um, such a loss and to such a gift for so many other families. So um, and I just really appreciate hearing all three of you all's um, story. Um, and so for me, not just as a, a TCHMB executive committee member, but on a more personal note, I am 26 weeks pregnant. Um, and so being African-American women and knowing all the statistics, studying MCH, working in MCH for so many years, you hear all the trauma stories, you know all <laughs> that can go wrong. And so there's all the terror that comes with it, right? And so in just thinking about all the statistics and thinking about all the things that we do know, um, what are some of those gaps in service? Um, Stephen and Tiffany, you guys talked about um, what happens on the other side, right? If a loss does occur um, in, in some of the support groups, Tiffany, you spoke about hearing others' experiences. So from your experience hearing that, um, both April and Brianna, when you look back on the experience, what are some of those gaps in service? Like, could you have used another advocate, the role of a doula? Like, what are some of those other um, services that can be brought in um, to help others to not experience the same things that you all did? And so that can be from each of your perspectives. Right. And so well, if you want to lead us or we can go in reverse order and let's see Stephen and Tiffany first. So for us, we definitely had moments in the hospital that were not pleasant in our interactions with the doctors. And I felt that at some time, I felt at times doctors were talking at me and not with me and that, um, I wasn't being spoken to as an equal, if that makes sense, when they be spoken down to. And I remember um, this particular day, I just had had it, I just had had it, you know, I just was like over it. I, you know, it was not, I was not pleasant. And we were, doctors and I were just not seeing eye to eye. And it took really, I say, there are two doctors that and the first one was Dr. David Wazoli. And he, uh, I think, knew that I was just, I mean, I was, I'm very vocal. I have no problem saying, speaking up when something is not going right. And so um, Dr. Wazoli is a white man, but I feel because he's a, Jew, he's a Jewish man. And I feel that he was able to say, hey, like, I see what, I see you're going through something. Let me pull another black doctor in to help you and to speak with you and give, let, she can come in, she can, she, you know, she hadn't observed the babies as of yet, but she can come in, see the babies and then give her opinion about the problem that we were facing at that immediate mo moment. And that doctor was Dr. Terry Kincaid. And if it wasn't for her, I feel like I wouldn't have gotten through it because she changed the, the, the trajectory of just the whole experience. Right. So it really did take, you know, two people who I feel like, um, our minorities to help me through a difficult, sometimes you feel like you're not being seen and you're not being heard. And it takes another person of color to be able to help you. And you know that, okay, if, if this woman is telling me something or she's telling me or giving me advice, um, this is, it's not because, you know, I'm black. Obviously she's giving me this advice because she, this is what her professional opinion and this is the right way. So, um, that was, that was me. I think that, that people have to see others that look like them when they're going through these experiences. And if they are not heard, sometimes it takes, it's only gonna be, you know, obviously there are more white doctors than black doctors. It takes white people to say, 
hey, maybe this, this patient, you know, this black woman is going through something. Maybe I can tap into some other people to help her because maybe we're not hearing her correctly. Maybe there's a, there's not a communication blockage there. Thank you. Stephen, do you want to add to what she said? No, honestly, um, Tiff uh, explained both sides of the spectrum. Um, in the beginning, it wasn't as pleasant, but we got to the goal of um, having Stephen cared for in the right way that we needed him to, to come home. You know, it was a, it was a long process. Um, one thing I would say is that our nurses, the nurses in the NICU were, were great. They were definitely... Uh, trying to uh, ease our minds and taking this, uh, you know, it's gonna be a roller coaster journey, but day by day it was uh, uh, a gradual process, but it, it worked out for the best. Thank you. And Brianna, do you wanna go next? Um, so, uh, well, in my case, uh, I don't really, feel, I, I don't really feel like an advocate probably would have helped. Uh, well, maybe probably a doula or, you know, somebody that would be able to be there to notice, like, the things that I couldn't um, notice, you know, that was going on, the clots, or not even that. Um, with the, the situation that happened those few weeks later, um, with the shortness of breath or the, the coughing, uh, I wouldn't have known anything, you know, I wouldn't have had a doula probably at home during that time. I wouldn't have had probably no advocate. Um, you know, I, my support system has always been a little small. Um, so, um, you know, I didn't really have a, a lot of help when it came to certain things. Uh, but for, I don't, I mean, maybe for other women, I guess, you know, having a doula or somebody there to be able to coach you through certain things would, would be good. But like in my case, I wasn't financially stable or able to be able to have extra support or care there. Um, so that would have been my case, um, you know, but other than that, I feel like just having that connection with the physicians or with my doctors actually helped a lot because even with my obstetrician, she know that it was some things that went wrong, but she still took time out of her little schedule. She came and visited me on the, uh, she came and visited me at the hospital when she found that one of her patients was on a cardiac floor. She came up there, she was apologizing. She was, you know, just talking to me. Um, and, you know, we kind of had a little connection and she actually been raising awareness for this condition ever since. Um, you know, so uh, we still kind of keep in contact. She's no longer my, my doctor anymore, but um, we still keep in contact on that. But other than that, I, I feel like mainly the main um, having a communication with your, your doctor, your physician itself can be so important or so much more important versus just having someone there to be looking to waiting on something to happen or waiting for something to go wrong because everybody's case is not like that. You know, we look at other women and be like, well, if she didn't go through that, she didn't go through that. Why did I go through that? <laughs> you know, so um, you don't know when you, you're supposed to actually have help or when you're supposed to actually have an advocate or somebody there. But, you know, that's just in my case or in my story, that being said. Thank you, Brianna. In April? Yeah, so kind of building off of what Brianna was saying, I actually had a doula, um, but one thing that I wish was that pretty much after delivery, my doula was fantastic, but after delivery, I didn't really see her or talk to her much after. Um, she was always text me if you need anything or call anything, but at that point, like, I wasn't thinking that a doula could help me in that situation. I just thought they were more to help with like the actual delivery. Um, so maybe if I would have had a better understanding, I would have called or reached out to her. Um, but that was kind of one thing. Um, probably the biggest thing that I wish I would have had was like an advocate in the ICU. Cause when I woke up in there, I had no idea what was going on. Like I was so confused, even when they would try to explain things to me, like it was, it was always very quick. It was like, okay, well, you had an infection. We don't know where it came from. Sorry, got to go. Like, I don't feel like anybody ever took the time to explain to me, like, here's where you started because I don't remember everything. So there was like these huge gaps of how is today already September 19th? Like, I don't know, like what happened between that time? So 
just having someone that could have explained to me like what's the last thing you remember and filled in all those gaps for me of what happened and what kind of care did I receive when I was in that medically induced coma I think would have been really really helpful for me um and just stronger relationships with everyone I think that I didn't have that I didn't really have anyone that was looking out for me as from the OBGYN team when I got to ICU those doctors were amazing the nurses were amazing but I just I wish I would have had stronger relationships with the OBGYN team um so that's kind of about it thank you um it is exactly 2 30. We have one question that just came in, but we are scheduled to have a break um, from 2.30 to 2.35. Um, and so I am going to still ask the question uh, and allow you all to answer, but I want to encourage our attendees if you need to go and grab a bathroom break or a snack, um, feel free. Um, but I definitely want to um, kind of honor our participants with this um, question that came in. Um, we had another one around um, pointers for the healthcare team as to how they could or did help you deal with um, severe illness and loss. And I think you all somewhat touched on some of that in, um, in your replies to this prior question. And so I'm gonna do this last one, which is how can we better educate women to the various risks of childbirth without scaring them? Um, there are so many rare conditions um, that can occur? How can we possibly educate them? To everything, especially the conditions that are more um, common in certain races. Um, and I think that's a, a difficult one from your perspective of being the patient um, and not the provider. But I, I want you to kind of think about that from the lens of you all um, going through that situation and, and feeling you both, all, everyone kind of mentioned a little bit about how they wish they would have known more. So how do we educate women or how could we do better about educating patients about the risk of childbirth without scaring them so they're better armed when they go into these situations? Um, can I speak? Go oh, for okay. it. Okay, um, well, to, I feel that maybe uh, as a physician or if I was in a physician's shoes, I always try to with shoes, um, with whatever I'm, you know, having experience with, I would probably be go off what happened with me based off the, um, the history, my cardiologist, when he came in, he automatically, he looked at the history file. Um, he noticed my sister, she was young, had a baby. He put all that together himself, you know, and then he asked me, okay, you are having this problem. You're having that. So he was like, you know, but plus he was familiar with PPCM. So, um, it was, you know, he came right in to do everything that he did. Um, but I would say the the history, and if there if there's no history, like we've had no cardiac history of um, of any type of diseases, but what could have been a good a detection was my blood type. Later on, or years later, I found out that my blood type was blood type B. And I didn't know that blood type B was a higher risk for cardiac problems. I didn't know that. Now I know that, um, I feel like that would be something that would be good for anybody, I guess, with blood type B, you know, to be aware that, you know, if you become pregnant or, you know, as you get older, you may come into certain cardiac conditions or you may have to watch out, watch out for your blood pressure or something like that. So in my personal case, it would have been the history you're trying to make sure, you know, what's going on in your foul. And then, you know, with the blood type, um, if the blood type means anything, or if you could figure out anything with that, um, you know, that, that I think those two things probably would have been good or benefited me in my case. And as well as my sister passing on, unfortunately, I lost her, but it was able to help my cardiologist as well put the pieces together uh, for my story and to be able to save me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did either of the other two speakers want to add or chime on that before we close out this session? I don't really have a very eloquent response. Um, I, I will say that I never heard of the NICU prior to being in the NICU. So, um, you know, when you go on the hospital tour and 
you do at your childbirth classes, that part is completely glossed over. So, you know, as a young mother, I was like, what's the NICU? <laughs> and I was just so confused. And it felt like there was this like bright and airy part of the hospital that you deliver a baby and it's so beautiful. And then you go on this long, dark hallway and you go in and you're like, it's just a culture shock because you just see all these sick babies and it's just such a sad part of the hospital. So it felt like I, it was like a whole world that was hidden behind a curtain. I'm like, I can't believe this was here the whole time. I came here before I delivered a baby last year. I had no idea that this was all here. So I'm, I definitely understand not wanting to scare patients, but them completely being in the dark is not helpful either. And I'll be really fast with my answer. Um, like somebody had mentioned in the comments, beefing up the childbirthing classes is obviously like one small way. And it kind of, I think it's kind of an easy way. Like, um, yes, it's probably scary to hear about these things that could go wrong, but it's a lot scarier when you don't know what's going on and you are just, you feel alone. Like I would rather somebody tell me what could go wrong than not knowing and go through what I went through. So um, that's one thing. And then the other thing that also sounds really simple is after my experience, my husband went to another hospital in our city and he saw all of these posters all over the walls and the elevators just about the symptoms of sepsis. And he texted me and he said, like he texted me a bunch of pictures and he said, why didn't our hospital have any of this? Like if we had seen something that had those symptoms that you were experiencing in the elevator, maybe we would have said like, hey, can you check for this? So it seems like something small, but for me, that could have made a big difference. Thank you, April. Many thanks to all three, four of our panelists. Um, really appreciate um, hearing all of your perspectives. Um, I am going to very quickly pass it back to um, Dr. Patrick Ramsey. Great, thank you, Janet. And thanks, thanks to our patient advocates who are here today. Those stories are so important for us to hear how we can improve care and, and prevent those, those type of events from happening. Uh, so we're going to go into our next session. If you need to take a bio break, feel free to just step away for a few minutes and come back in.